This lecture is about the analysis of the contracts question, which was on the July 2005 California bar exam. I've chosen this question because uh, it illustrates the fraud issues, how to analyze a fraud question, and it's subtle enough. The fraud is subtle enough that if you don't know the elements that you're looking for, you'll miss the whole thing. Uh, let me read you the problem and let's do the analysis together. Problem reads as follows. Stan and Barb entered into a valid written contract. There goes your formation issues. The most you would say about formation is, according to the facts, Stan and Barb had a valid contract. Whereby one, Stan agreed to convey uh, to Barb 100 acres of agricultural land and water rights in an adjacent stream. And two, Barb agreed to pay Stan $100,000. Okay. When Stan and Barb were negotiating the deal, Stan said, quote, you know, I want to make sure the property will still be used for farming and not developed, close quote. Barb replied simply, quote, well, I can certainly understand your feelings, close quote. In fact, Barb intended to develop the land as a resort. Now, there's the fraud. Let's lay it out and deal with it. Fraud. Definition. First, I want to be clear that fraud is a tort. and that fraud is the same thing as intentional misrepresentation. Intentional misrepresentation is often referred to as fraud. <clears throat> the elements of fraud are as follows. The misrepresentation uh, of a material fact I'm going to uh, change something here. I'm going to number I'm going to number these so you can uh, it's sometimes easier to remember things if, people, if they're numbered. And so the fraud is number one. The misrepresentation, two, <clears throat> of a material fact, number three, <clears throat> with scienter, Sorry about the little problem here, <clears throat> but I, uh, <clears throat> when you erase this board with this, uh, these funny fluids, it won't, they, they won't write for a few minutes. Mater misrepresentation of material fact with scienter. Intent to induce reliance. Number five, actual reliance. And number six, reasonableness of the reliance. This is sometimes referred to as justifiable reliance or reasonableness of the reliance. And number seven, damages. I'm going to have to get another marker because this one apparently has died. <clears throat> 
So these are the seven requirements of fraud. Uh, it's a long list, but fraud is tested often enough that it's worth memorizing this, so I would plan to do that. The, let's talk about each of these for just a moment. The misrepresentation uh, can either be what's called affirmative misrepresentation, which is just another fancy word for lying, and uh, the other way is failure to disclose where there's a duty to disclose. Now on the board I just have the words failure to disclose, but I think it's obvious to you if you don't have a duty to disclose it's not a problem. So it's failure to disclose when one has a duty to disclose, and so the question then becomes when does one have a duty to disclose? And there are several situations where there's a duty to disclose. One is to your fiduciary. And I think we all agree that one must disclose to their fiduciary. Number two is the half-truth case. The half-truth case is the case where you tell someone half a truth and don't tell them the rest of it, and you know that the person is relying on that being the whole story and that they will be injured based on, because of that reliance. Now, the bar examiners, when they've tested fraud, have almost always tested it where the duty to disclose came out of this half-truth situation. Uh, there's several examples from the bar exam where they've done that. In this case, where, uh, where uh, uh, in, this, in this case, where the uh, uh, where uh, Stan has said to Barb, I really don't want this property used for development, and Barb says, uh, I can understand that. Well, that would be treated as a half truth. She knows he has been misled by what she said. You know, what she said is you know kind of a nothing, uh, but uh, that's a half truth. There have been some other examples where the bar examiners have tested the half truth. One example, the, uh, the, the person said, um, 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 was, this person was an agent of a museum who wanted to buy a particular painting that was hard to find. And she found someone who had the painting. And this person who had the painting says, OK, I'll sell it to you. But I really uh, want to keep this in private collections, not in museum public collections. And the person who was buying it was representing a museum, and she said nothing. That would be treated as a half-truth, misleading. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, so you see how when the person has been misled, but you didn't really say anything false, that's treated as half-truths. Uh, continuing with these, where you have a duty to disclose, the uh, new information this is where the person who provided the information thought what they were saying was truthful at the time and they later got new information saying that what they told this victim was false and they know the victim is out there relying on what they told them and so with this new information you got to go and tell them the disclose the, uh, the new information. The fourth situation where there's a duty to disclose is new reliance. The new reliance case is where the person who told the victim something knew they was, what they were saying was false, but they didn't expect the person to rely on it. You know, I'm selling you my 1934 Hupmobile, if there was such a car, and uh, I tell you, gee, you know, this thing will go 100 miles an hour. Well, you know, 150 miles an hour. Well, if you drive that car 100 miles an hour, it'd come apart into all of its nuts and bolts. Uh, and you didn't expect the person to rely on that. And you later find out they're planning to race the car. Well, then with this, when you discover that they're going to rely on what you know is false information, duty to disclose. And the fifth and last case where there is a duty to disclose, 
is the case where I am selling you a painting that looks very much like the Mona Lisa. In fact, it is so good that it has deceived several museums. And I'm selling it to you and you think it's the real Mona Lisa. But I know it's not. This is a situation where I know something about the, the goods that I'm selling to you or property that I'm selling to you. And it is very difficult for you to find out what I know about it. And it materially affects the value of the property. There's a duty to disclose. Uh, there was a case on the bar exam where a person was selling a house uh, in the middle of the summer in the middle of the United States, Kansas or someplace. And uh, it, uh, the, the, it was summertime, but the roof leaked like a sieve during the wintertime. And the, uh, the buyer in the summertime didn't know that and didn't have any easy way or any reason to suspect. And the courts held that there was a duty to disclose because you know that the roof is leaking and these people can't find out very easily. Uh, another case was one where uh, the, the land was being, a house was, uh, uh, I'm selling you a house and I know that my house is built on landfill in earthquake country. And you don't know that, and it would be very difficult for you to find that out. You have to get a survey or something to find that out. Well, duty to disclose because I know and you don't, and it's very hard for you to find out. I don't know what you call that, so I don't have a name for it. But that is a situation where obviously there's a duty to disclose. And again, it is this half-truth here that is most commonly tested when these issues come up. I don't know why my markers keep disappearing. This is the one that is tested. So, fraud is all these seven things, and the misrepresentation is usually by this method. Material fact, you know what a material fact is about, and to explain to the examiner why the fact is material. Scienter simply means a bad state of mind, and the person uh, can either with known falsity is one form of scienter where I know what I'm telling you is false. And the other form is where I have acted in reckless disregard of the truth. That I tell you something is true or not true and I really don't know one way or another and it matters to you whether it's true or not. So either reckless disregard for the truth or known falsity will get you the scienter. Intent to induce reliance, you know what that is. Actual reliance, you know what that is. Reasonableness of the reliance. What this is saying is that you know people can't just act a fool and rely on stuff that no reasonable person would rely on. For example, in my 1934 Hubmobile case, that's probably a case where a reasonable person would know that this old car isn't going to do 150 miles an hour. And so probably relying on that would not be reasonable. It was a sales pitch and everybody knows it. And so the reliance needs, sometimes this is called justifiable reliance. So it's either justifiable or reasonable reliance meaning you can't just act a fool and then expect to collect money, and you've got to be damaged in some way. It doesn't have to be money damages, but you've got to be damaged. So this is what constitutes fraud. Now, in our case, with Stan and Barb, what happened is that uh, 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 Barb misled Stan by not disclosing what she intended to do with the property. That was material fact. This was material to uh, Stan because he didn't want the land developed. Scienter, she knew she was lying. Intent to induce reliance, certainly Barb intended to induce Stan to rely. Stan did rely, that's your actual uh, reliance. Reasonable for him to rely, yes, under these circumstances, very reasonable. And Stan was damaged because his land is now going to be developed. It's an aesthetic damage, it's not money damage, but he has a right to, uh, to uh, uh, aesthetic uh, considerations also. So if he was damaged, even in this sense, that's still a damage. And so we now have that Barb committed fraud against Stan. So let us continue with the problem. In the second paragraph, the conveyance was to take place on June the 1st. On May 15, Stan called Barb and told her that the deal was off. Now that sounds like anticipatory repudiation, but let's continue. Stan then said, that a third party named Tom had offered to pay him $130,000 for the land. Well, that's no reason to breach the contract, and so that really isn't relevant. But we then go on, and it says, uh, 
Stan also said <clears throat> that he had discovered that Barb intended to develop the land, so he's discovered the fraud. Now, when the other side has committed fraud, what are your remedies? What can you do? Uh, so the remedy, remedy for fraud is either you can rescind, the victim can rescind the contract, or they can enforce it. That is to say, if you commit fraud against me by telling me that uh, if I give you $10,000, uh, you will give me Blackacre, when really, in fact, you intended just to defraud me of, black, of the 10000 well, once we've made this contract, if you own Blackacre, I can sue and, and to enforce the contract. So I actually get it. So that's often it's a good idea to enforce. Uh, or I can rescind the contract uh, if I wish for fraud. So in this situation then, uh, 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 Stan, who is the victim, can either enforce the contract or rescind it. Obviously, uh, Stan has chosen to rescind the contract, so we're rescinding for fraud right here. Continuing with the problem, in the third paragraph it says, on May the 16th, uh, Bart discovered that Stan had title to only 90 of the 100 acres and that he does not have the water rights. Ah, so if Stan can, if you find the fraud, and this is kind of a close case, but if you find the fraud, obviously Stan has decided to rescind and that's the end of it. But if you don't find the fraud, then she is going to try to enforce the contract and she's saying, Stan, you can only deliver 90 acres and you promised me 100. And that's a breach. Now let me tell you about these <coughs> breaches of contract that involve the conveyance, uh, conveyance of a certain amount of land. If I am buying Blackacre from you, and Blackacre is really a ranch, and the deal is that I'm buying this ranch for $100,000, which consists of 100 acres more or less, and uh, the farming equipment and so forth, and it turns out that the farm really is only 99 acres. Well, the, the term said 100 acres more or less, and so that, that's acceptable, there's no problem. On the, because in, in particular, since it's an operating ranch, I'm really buying the ranch and the business and the land and so forth altogether. On the other hand, if I'm buying 100 acres from you, not 100 acres more or less, I'm buying 100 acres and I'm buying it for development, then I really want the 100 acres because my development plan, how many houses I can sell and so forth, depends on how much land I've got. So in that situation, I really need the 100 acres. And if you can't deliver the 100 acres, that's going to be a breach. Here, uh, Stan was to deliver to Barb 100 acres. Not 100 acres more or less, but 100 acres. And when he cannot deliver 100 acres, that's a breach. Let's see, how do we know that's a breach? That's easy because a breach of contract uh, uh, is the non-performance of a contract duty which has become absolute. And here are the parties, uh, the, the, uh, the existence of the contract is given. And I erase this breach here. And the contract is given and then the breach of contract is the non-performance of a contract duty which has become absolute. Contract duties are absolute when all conditions preceding have occurred, have been excused. Here there were no conditions preceding to Stan's duty to convey the land. Time for performance has arrived. Well, time hasn't really arrived yet. They got another 14 days. Uh, but, uh, in, uh, but Stan, has, uh, Stan won't be able to deliver. Uh, the, uh, uh, you, uh, Barb can sue. Uh, on the grounds that uh, even though time for performance has not yet arrived, if, if uh, Stan doesn't have the 100 acres and doesn't have any reasonable way of getting it, Stan, she can sue now. It's not the same as anticipatory repudiation where you tell them I'm not going to do it, but it's the same in the sense that you figure out that, it's, that the person really isn't going to do it. For example, 
this is called prospective inability to perform. So if I'm supposed to build a, in a six unit apartment building for you and I'm supposed to finish next week and you come out to look at the land and I've done nothing at all, even though I don't say to you I'm not going to finish on time, that would be repudiation. That's a breach. But I, I say nothing. I say, oh, don't worry, I'll be done in two weeks. Well, you know I can't build a six unit apartment house in two weeks. And so we have prospective inability to perform. And that's treated the same as anticipatory repudiation. So she doesn't have to wait any longer. She can sue now based on anticipatory repudiation. And finally, the duty must not be discharged. The contract duty not discharged. And as you know, there are lots of ways to discharge the contract duties. None of them happen in our case. So we do have a breach, former contract and a breach. And now, what damages, what is the, what is the remedy for uh, Stan's breach? And the remedy is that, uh, in, that, first of all, Barb can simply, uh, you know, not perform. She can sue for, sue for damages, and, but Barb wants the land. And so if she's going to buy the land and he only has 90 acres, then the rule is abatement, that he has a right, uh, she has a right to reduce the price according to the missing land. So the remedy is going to be abatement of the purchase price. And in this case, 10 acres obviously is worth uh, uh, $10,000. The land was... Uh, uh, $1,000 an acre. So you get abatement of $10,000. Uh, and that's the damages. And she wants specific performance. So she'll want specific performance to get the land. And specific performance, as you know, I'm doing fine, mom and dad. Hi, inadequate remedy at law. Uh, if this is real property. Uh, Land is unique. Remedial law is always inadequate. Definite contract terms. There's no question about what Stan's supposed to do. Feasible to enforce. Yes, the court can enforce this because they can make Stan convey the title or the court can convey the title itself. Mutuality. If the court is going to make Stan convey the title, they're going to make Barb pay for it. And then finally defenses. Now we got a serious problem because Barb has unclean hands. At the very least, she has unclean hands. Uh, even, if she, even if you don't find that this was fraud, she has unclean hands. And so you have a defense. You have a defense to her suit for specific performance. She might get damages, but not specific performance. Uh, so let's turn to the rest of the problem now. Uh, by, by the way, talking about these conveyances of land, let me tell you one more thing. If I'm buying Black Acre from you, and it says 100 acres more or less, and if you, you've got 99 acres, well, that's fine. I'll pay the, Don't even debate the price, because it said 100 acres more or less. And so I paid you the $100,000 for, for almost 100 acres. On the other hand, if the acreage is not 99, where it's almost 100, and it says 100 acres more or less, and what you've got is... Eh, quite a bit less. You got 93 acres or something. Well, that's quite a bit less. And in that case, we would abate the purchase price. But if what you've got is 50 acres, that's a breach. And uh, in that case, uh, I can sue for the uh, damages for breach of contract. Uh, so if you have all, if it says more or less, and it's just a little bit off, that's okay. If it's off kind of significantly, then you abate the price. If it's off a lot, it's a breach. Now, uh, in our case, we don't have 100 acres more or less, so we don't have that problem, but I want you to know those rules. Uh, so continuing with the problem then, it says, uh, Barb still wishes to purchase the property. However, it will cost her $15,000 to purchase the water. Well, that's a breach contract. He was supposed to deliver the water. And of course, once again, uh, Stan has the right to rescind the contract, but if he doesn't rescind, uh, if because you didn't find the fraud, then she can sue for damages. And if it costs fifteen thousand dollars to get the water someplace else, then of course that's her damages, and she's entitled to that fifteen thousand. So if if 
If the, the contract may be terminated for fraud, rescinded for fraud, in which case it's all over. If it's not rescinded for fraud and she wants to sue, uh, what she will get is the $15,000 for the, for the uh, water rights. She will get the $10,000 for the fact that there's only 90 acres of land and, um, the, and she will not be able to get specific performance because of her unclean hands. Okay. And that is the end of this analysis. Again, one of the key things about this is the fraud. You need to know these elements of fraud. Memorize them. There's seven of them. It's worth memorizing. It comes up in lots of places and you need to know them. And that's the end of this lecture. This lecture uh, is uh, a lecture on the question from the July 1995 California Bar Exam, the lab disco question. And of all the questions which have been on the exam, I chose this one uh, to illustrate how parole evidence rule and ambiguity are tested. They're off, almost always tested together. And this is another example of how they're tested together, and I wanted you to see this good example. The question, uh, I will go through and read the facts of the question and discuss issues as we discuss them. That's not necessarily the way you'd write it. You, this is a contracts question, and you write it the way we write contracts questions normally. Uh, but I'll read the facts and discuss the issues as they appear. In 1991, Lab entered into a written signed contract with disposal specialists called Disco, disposal company, Disco. Uh, and uh, the uh, providing, now, first of all, they tell you these people entered into a written signed contract, so the, the formation issues are not there. The most you can do is say, according to the facts, the parties had a contract, and here are the terms. Uh, the terms provided that the disposal company, um, uh, let's back up for a second, lab produces hazardous waste material. And the contract provided that lab's hazardous waste material for the next five years would be uh, disposed of by disposal company for $40,000 per year. Now notice, five years, $40,000 per year, that's a $200,000 contract. That's a, Significant contract. Paragraph 8D provides, quote, Disco agrees to remove the specified waste products from the lab site within 48 hours of being notified that lab's waste containment vessel is 80% full. Okay. And so basically Disco says, we'll dispose of your stuff for you. Call us when it's 80% full and we will uh, come and get it. Now please notice that there is an obligation here. There's a duty by Disco the disposal company, to come out and pick up this stuff when they get the notice. But there is no obligation, there's no duty of lab to notify them. Okay? Basically, this is a, a contract when the company is supposed to, uh, they, they want to get their waste products emptied, and they call somebody, and you don't want to call them when the, comp when the container is 1% full, 5% full, so they made an arrangement when it's getting full, 80% full will call you. Now, if Lab never calls Disco, that's not a breach of contract. Lab doesn't owe them a duty to call. It's simply a condition precedent to Disco's duty to empty the waste. Uh, a lot of people uh, uh, jump on that point, and there is no duty by Lab to call. Next paragraph. At 4.30 p.m. on Friday, May 26, 1995. Now, please notice, this is the fourth year of this contract. Contract was formed in 1991. It's now 1995, so they've been doing this for four years. Uh, and Lab notified Disco that the waste containment was 90% full. Now, some people jump on that and try to treat it like a breach of contract because they didn't notify them until it was 90% full. Well, they're not obligated to notify them until it's, you know, they, they, they're not obligated to notify them at all. But, uh, the, uh, and so there's no breach here by the mere fact that they didn't notify them until it was 90% full. Uh, and that it was important that the container be emptied. The disco manager responded that the waste could not be picked up until the morning, till the following Tuesday morning because of Memorial Day that's occurring on Monday, May 29th. Um, well, that's interesting because disco is saying uh, we can't do it until Tuesday morning. Now we continue. Uh, but, but notice that the, the contract says that Disco is to pick up within 48 hours of being notified. And now Disco is saying we can't pick it up in 48 hours because of the holiday. And so is, 
Is there an exception for the holiday weekend? Well, let's take a look. Let's keep reading. It says, uh, Disco's manager asserted that the 48-hour deadline, uh, pardon me, on June 10th, Lab informed Disco that it was terminating the contract. I skipped a line or two, I'm sorry. So Disco's manager responded that the waste could not be picked up until the following Tuesday morning on Memorial Day because of the Memorial Day holiday is on May 29th. Disco emptied the waste uh, container early Tuesday morning, but Lab's work was interrupted because until then the container was completely filled and as a result, Lab incurred a $9,000 loss. New paragraph. On June the 10th, now this is about uh, two weeks later, uh, June the 10th, Lab informed Disco that it was terminating the contract because of the delayed pickup. Well, now do they have a right to terminate? Remember that the innocent party can terminate if there is a material breach, but not for a minor breach. For a minor breach, you, you pay damages or whatever you have to do and keep on going. For a material breach, the innocent party can terminate the contract. And here, Lab is saying, we're terminating. So they're claiming this was a material breach. We'll have to see. Next sentence. In reply, Disco's manager asserted that the 48-hour deadline did not apply over holiday weekends and that he had mentioned this during their 1991 negotiations. And so really what's happening is that Lab, Disco is saying uh, that the 48 hours uh, does not apply to holiday weekends, but that's not in writing. It doesn't show that in writing. Now you can look at this two ways. You can look at this as a term that should have been in writing and wasn't there, and now uh, Disco wants to get this oral statement added to the contract that it's not to be picked up on holiday weekends. Can, can Disco get this oral statement added to the contract? The answer is probably no. And it's probably no because Disco uh, said the holiday weekends don't, the 48 hours doesn't apply to holiday weekends, but, uh, uh, but uh, Lab did not respond saying, yes, we agree to that. So it's not a term of the contract that they can get added. So as a parole evidence rule, they're not going to be able to add that term in there because it was never agreed on. It was just mentioned. On the other hand, under ambiguity, you may have an issue because the lab, the disco is saying, we are interpreting the 48 hours to mean it does not apply on holiday weekends. And a lab is not saying how they're interpreting it at all. They didn't respond. So you have more of an ambiguity problem than you do a parole evidence. You have to discuss parole evidence but the real solution is going to lie in ambiguity. Continuing to read, it says that, uh, in fact, Disco had gone beyond the 48-hour uh, period on at least four holiday weekends during the last three years. But now we got a problem there because uh, obviously these people have a misunderstanding about whether or not the holiday weekend, whether or not the 48 hours applies to a holiday weekend. And they have a misunderstanding because Disco says, thinks it does not apply and apparently a Lab now wants to apply it. But we have four examples that happened during the last three years where the Lab did not empty over the 48 hour on a holiday weekend and Disco did not complain. So you can see how you're going to use that conduct to show that this indicates what the parties really intended to clarify the ambiguity that the 48-hour rule does not apply on holiday weekends, and therefore Disco will not, pardon me, Lab will not be able to enforce it on this occasion. So continuing to read, it says, in fact, Disco has gone beyond the 48-hour period for at least four holiday weekends during the last three years without complaint from Lab. And twice Lab's waste manager had approved a holiday weekend pickup that was 96 hours after notice. Well, we don't have that situation but it does show that normally they weren't treating the, uh, the schedule as being all that uh, uh, important to really stick right to it. But in any event, uh, the, the 48 hours has been not followed for four occasions in a row, and that's pretty strong evidence that that's what they intended. Disco's manager threatened to sue if Lab tried to uh, 
terminate the contract. So that's where we are. The question is, can lab terminate the contract? Well, let's go through the whole thing. Formation. Formation was given, and so you don't need to uh, go through offer acceptance and that sort of thing. If you did that, the bar examiners would think you're crazy because they gave you the contract. You may need to recite the terms. According to the facts, a contract was, uh, the parties had a contract and the terms were. Then you put the 40-hour thing in there. Uh, the terms, the interpretation of the terms, we have parole evidence rule, ambiguity, and mistake. We do not have mistake in this case, but we do have a parole evidence rule. Now, under the parole evidence rule, uh, the problem, the rule itself, the rule itself says that you may not use expressions which were made prior to or contemporaneously with the execution of the contract. You may not use those expressions to add to, vary, or contradict the terms of the contract. Okay. So you may not use, so here we have such an oral expression. We have an expression by Disco saying, 48 hours doesn't apply on holiday weekends. Well, if, uh, if Lab had agreed to that, then there's a question of does this term that they agreed to belong in, should, it should have been in writing. The fact that it's not in writing, will you be able to add this oral term or not? That's what the parole evidence rule is about. But in this case, Lab never really agreed to it. So you don't really have a new term to add on there. Uh, the, uh, so the rule is you cannot use new terms, you cannot use <coughs> expressions made prior to or contemporaneous with the execution of the contract to add to, vary, or contradict the terms of the contract if, if, if the parties intended for the writing to be integrated. Did they intend for the writing to be the final and complete expression? So this whole parole evidence rule does not apply to anybody unless the parties intended for the writing to be their final and complete expression. Well, do we have, in this case, how do, the question becomes, how do you decide whether a writing was intended by the parties to be their final and complete expression? And that's where we have the split of authority, the Williston view and the Corbin view. Now, I realize that you can argue that there's really no reason to even discuss the parole evidence rule because the uh, lab never really agreed. But I think that the bar examiners wanted to discuss the parole evidence rule anyway, so we're doing it. Williston says, the question now between Williston and Corbin is, how do you determine whether or not the parties intended for this writing to be integrated, their final and complete expression? Williston says what you do is you look at the document itself and stay within the four corners of the document. And if the document is a contract that these two people might rationally have entered into, then that is it. That is the contract, and you can't add this stuff that they talked about before uh, to the writing. Once again, the Williston view is the way you determine whether or not the parties intended for this writing to be final and complete is you look at the writing itself and say, does this make sense for these two people? And if it does, that's the end of it. And so if the, in our case, here these parties might very well, Lab and Disco, might very well have entered into a contract where the 48 hours did not apply to holiday weekends. It's not so irrational. And so under the Williston view, you would use the writing itself to see if, if the parties intended for it to be final and complete, and it seems like it does. Now, uh, under the Williston view, uh, the, one of the things you would point out is that uh, the this, this is a contract that's got at least eight paragraphs. And so that's more evidence that they intended this, for this to be a, a completed contract. Also, uh, remember that this is a contract between two corporations uh, for five years for $200,000. And the people who wrote this contract realized they may not be working for that corporation in five years. So for, based on that, they would have wanted the writings to be complete the size of the contract, the duration of the contract, it's between two corporations where the negotiators are, may not be there in five years. All that is evidence that the parties intended for this writing to be the final and complete expression. Now, 
you may not even need, I would argue all that under Williston, but what Williston really says is if these parties might have entered into this contract, uh, if that's rational for them, then that's the end of it. But when you turn to the Corbin view, that's when you really need all that other evidence that I was just reciting. The Corbin view says that you may look outside the document and gather all the relevant evidence that you can find as to what was the real intent of the parties. Now remember that the, the legal system now has a lot of experience in determining people's intent. Uh, you have it in all of the, in most crimes, there's an intent issue. In a lot of the, in the intentional torts are intentional issues. So there are all kinds of places where you have to determine people's intent. Uh, and so given that experience, why not use it here and try to determine what the real intent of the parties was rather than this artificial thing of the Four Corners Rule, the Four Corners Rule being the Williston view. So under the Corbin view, you gather all the evidence you can as to whether or not this document was intended to be integrated, and the evidence that you have available is, again, that is a $200,000 contract, it's between two corporations, and the negotiators may not be there in five years. Uh, it's a five-year contract, that's a long period of time. The writing contained at least eight paragraphs. So when you put all that together, it really looks like they intended for this to be their final and complete expression. So under both the Williston view, the Four Corners Rule, and the Corbin view, the All Relevant Evidence Rule, in both cases we find that under the Parole Evidence Rule, you may not add to very or contradict the terms because the parties intended for this writing to be complete, to be integrated. Now there's a full lecture on the Parole Evidence Rule and ambiguity, and I encourage you to take a look at that sometime. The second point here under interpretation is ambiguity. This is where we stand a chance of winning. Uh, uh, when a, a document is ambiguous, when it has more than one, when the words or the, or the phrases have more than one meaning. And please keep in mind that in all of these bar questions where there is ambiguity, that you will, that it won't look ambigu ambiguous when you, when the parties form the contract. People don't normally get into contracts with each other when it's obviously an ambiguous term there that matters. They tend not to do that. And so when you see these questions on the bar, the argument, the term that turns out to be ambiguous will not appear to be ambiguous at first. Here it looks like 48 hours. How can the number 48 be ambiguous? And the ambiguity, however, occurs when one party thinks that the 48-hour rule applies and the other one thinks it doesn't apply on holiday weekends. So uh, the uh, ambiguous, to clarify an ambigu ambiguity, the basic rule is to try to determine the intent of the parties. Uh, the intent can be expressed uh, and the, uh, uh, if the intent is expressed, then of course you use it. But if they did not tell you what their intent was, then you try to figure it out. Under the UCC, and this is not a UCC problem, 2-202 is used to uh, make this same rule. But uh, ours is a common law problem, and it says here in, in common law that you can use the conduct of the parties to try to figure out what the parties intended. If the conduct of the parties shows, for in our case, for example, that four times in a row the uh, disco did not empty the waste on holiday weekends. And when disco did not empty waste on holiday weekends four times in a row, uh, that suggests that that's what the parties intended when they formed the contract. And so course of performance would lead you to that conclusion. Remember there are three, uh, three uh, uh, factors that you can use here in trying to determine intent uh, when you don't have, when the party is not expressed. One way is that it is the uh, a course of performance, meaning the course of these same two people in the same contract when the same issue came up before, what did these people do about that issue? And here we have four times in a row that they did not empty on holiday weekends within 48 hours and lab did not complain. A second uh, uh, standard that you can use is uh, course of dealing, instead of course of performance, it's course of dealing. Course of dealing means same two parties, they deal with each other in other contracts. And if the same issue came up in other contracts, 
then you can see how they dealt with it then. And of course, that would help to determine what they might have meant this time. And the third uh, way that you can uh, help to de determine the, con the, uh, the uh, meaning of an ambiguous term is custom in the industry. Certain terms are used in the industry a lot, and uh, uh, the whatever the custom in the industry. For in this, for example, in this case, is it the custom in the industry that people who are doing disposal pickup do not pick up on holiday weekends? That might be used as a custom in the industry. But in our case, we've got something better than custom in the industry. We have something better than course of dealing. We have course of actual performance between these people, and that's how we would conclude that the parties uh, did not intend to enforce the 48-hour rule on holiday weekends. Um, the, so that takes care. We've formed the contract. We've interpreted it. We've decided that the parole evidence rule um, uh, does apply. They intended for the writing to be final and complete. By the way, one of the other ways you can intend for a writing to be final and complete is for the parties to put it in their contract saying this writing is, a, is the entire contract, it's final and complete, it's integrated, that's called a merger clause. And so if the merger clause is there, that certainly says they intended for the writing to be final and complete and you can't add anything. The exceptions to that merger clause use occur when, uh, first of all, the merger clause might be part of a form contract and it's a five page contract with lots of small print that nobody reads. And so the courts are more reluctant, I'm not saying they will or won't, but they're more reluctant to, uh, to take a term out of these form contracts and hold it against somebody. So they might not apply the merger clause just because it's buried in all this print and the parties probably didn't notice it. Whereas if these people were forming a contract and each of the two parties went to their lawyers and they negotiated a special contract for their situation, and that contract has a merger clause, well, that'll be, that'll be enforced, obviously. A second situation where you may not enforce a merger clause is where the merger clause itself was induced by fraud. Uh, it's, uh, the parties, one party was misleading the other one on purpose and uh, included a merger clause that would probably not be enforced. So in our case, full evidence rule does apply. They will not be able to add to, vary, or contradict the terms. However, the term was ambiguous, and we clarified the ambiguity by, um, by course of performance. Now, continue with the problem. We've formed the contract. We've interpreted the terms. Next comes changes in the contract. Were there any changes? Well, in our case, uh, you can, if you change the people, we don't have a case where there's any change in people, like uh, third-party rights or anything of that sort. But we do have a possible change in the terms of the contract. Uh, by modification, you would argue that this, the contract has, uh, has been, uh, 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 in, they've been going on for four years. They've done this for four years in a row. The, other, the lab hasn't complained. And that if DISCO has come to rely on this, and if they've relied in such a way that for DISCO to now uh, Re, to revoke the waiver, they've been sort of waiving their rights for four years, if they had a right. Uh, for di if they've relied on this, and it would be to their significant detriment to, to, for, to allow a, a lab to revoke these waivers, then the waivers might be permanent. Now you've got a modification. Uh, I don't see anything about a lab situation where they're so detrimentally relied that it would be grossly unfair for a lab to reinstate the waivers now. So you probably do not have a modification by conduct because I don't think the reliance has been so bad that lab would be, that DISCO would be detrimentally affected. Waiver, however, a, a DISCO, pardon me, lab has waived, if it had a right, it has waived it several times. And when you have reasonable reliance, uh, and this is certainly reasonable reliance, that requires notice. And so uh, lab would have to notify DISCO that it's revoking the waiver. So again, if you have induced reasonable reliance, and we have that here with these waivers, that requires notice before you revoke the waiver. That takes care of the changes. And so we do not have a modification, and we do, not, and, uh, we do have waivers, and lab did not 
notify FISCO of the waivers, and so they might not be able to revoke the waivers that quickly without giving some notice. Do we have a breach? Answer, uh, there's no breach if there is no duty. If there is no duty to, to pick up on holiday weekends, obviously there's no breach, and that may be the case. On the other hand, if there is a breach, because lab, uh, DISCO is obligated to pick up on holiday weekends, if there is a breach because DISCO is obligated to pick up, then it's a minor breach. How do we know it's a minor breach? Because we go to the restatement, restatement 241 has these six factors that you use to help decide whether something is a minor breach or a material breach. Um, in a minor breach, the general idea is the person has gotten the substantial benefit of their bargain. But that's such a, you know, has so many factors. Did a person really get the substantial benefit that you'll do much better if you go to Restatement 241 and literally memorize these six factors? These same six factors are the ones that you use to dis determine whether someone has committed a minor breach versus a material breach and also whether or not there has been substantial performance. Same thing. If I have substantially performed, then if I breached at all, it was a minor breach. And if I haven't even substantially performed, then the breach is a more serious breach. That's a material breach. And the same six factors are used in either case, and this is tested enough so that it really would be to your best interest to memorize these. Restatement 241, the extent to which performance has already been rendered, well, four years out of a five-year contract. Was the breach willful? No, I wasn't willful. It was a mere misunderstanding. The uncertainty that the breaching party will complete the contract. Well, it looks here as though uh, DISCO is perfectly willing to, to complete the remaining year, uh, and so there's no uncertainty that, about that. Uh, the benefit already received. This is, uh, has, has LAB received uh, up to this point. What, they received everything they bargained for up to this point. And so they received everything they bargained for except for this one misunderstanding. Uh, DISCO is willing to continue the remainder of the year. Doesn't look like a material breach to me. Will dollars adequately compensate the, the victim of the breach? And the answer is, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, they lost $9,000. You can pay them the $9,000. They can get somebody else to complete. Hardship on the defendant. Well, the defendant is DISCO. And if you, if you terminate the contract, is that a significant hardship on DISCO? Well, not that big a deal because they obviously have got other customers and this is the last year of this contract and so it's not an unusual hardship. When you put all these factors together, I think most reasonable people would agree that this was a minor breach, a misunderstanding and a minor breach. And therefore, LAB does not have the right to terminate the contract. The conclusion is, they have no right to terminate because the breach was a minor breach. Um, the, again, the critical things that I want you to get from this problem are the parole evidence rule, ambiguity, and do listen to the full lecture on those. These two are together on a lecture, uh, but this was an excellent illustration of it. And finally, the, uh, the uh, minor breach as opposed to a material breach. And that's, if you got that out of this contract, and also we have some waivers here. This is important that there were, uh, their DISCO uh, uh, relied on the, uh, if, there, if DISCO was obligated to pick it up on holiday weekends four times in a row, they didn't do it, and it looks like waivers by lab, and if they're going to waive that often, and, and, and the person obviously they're going to learn to rely on that, you got to give notice if you want to revoke the waiver. And that's the end of this lecture.